Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Randy Ingermanson. Hi Randy! Hey Joanna! It's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction, Randy is a physicist and award-winning geek suspense novelist, also known as the Snowflake Guy, America's mad professor of fiction writing. His site, advancedfictionwriting.com, is packed with loads of information and inspiration on organising, creating and marketing your work. So Randy, I'm fascinated with your branding because you're combining physics, novels and TV teaching authors about writing. So tell us a bit about how that came to be. Well, you know, like every other novelist who ever created a website, you know, I asked myself, what am I going to put on my website? Well, there's the obvious stuff about my book, but then, of course, uh, I wanted to put on stuff on there about how to write fiction. Now, that's actually a stupid thing to do. It's, it's uh, you know, but all novelists do it anyway, right? We, we, uh, we think that our readers are going to be incredibly fascinated about how, you know, how the sausages was made, how, how, how this book is produced. And actually, most readers don't care. Mm -hmm. Only really about one person in a thousand cares about writing a novel, whereas you know, a, a high fraction of the population likes to read novels. So it's really a dumb thing to do. But... But we both you know, do it. <laughs> but we all do it, you know, and I did it thinking that, oh, this is, you know, of course everyone's going to want to know how this is done. And so I started, um, you know, putting a few articles out there. There was my uh, uh, article on uh, how to write a novel using the snowflake method, another one on writing the perfect scene. And what I noticed after a couple of years was that the highest traffic pages on my site were the ones on how to write fiction, uh, which is a, a little discouraging if you're hoping to actually sell your, your novels. But uh, at a certain point, I realized, hey, you know, if people are interested in this stuff, I should, I should work more on it. If something is succeeding, then, then, you know, feed that fire. So I started putting out more articles, and at a certain point, I, I just spun off uh, those articles onto a separate website at uh, advancedfictionwriting.com, and that has been just tremendously successful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, of course, every everyone has their own wacko personality, uh, and so I sort of adopted the personality that fits me, which is mad scientist. Okay, I, I'm in real life. I'm a physicist. I have a yeah, it sounds scary. I have a PhD in theoretical physics from UC Berkeley, you know, and uh, so I, I know physics. And uh, what I bring to the table really is a logical way of thinking about things. Uh, here's how physics is constructed. I can show you the architecture of physics. Here's how a scene, uh, sorry, a story. Here, here's how a story is constructed. Uh, here's how a scene is constructed. Uh, and of course, there's more than that. It, it's not just a paint by numbers approach to writing, <clears throat> but having a good process does help you. Uh, you know, uh, William Faulkner is supposed to have said once. Um, somebody asked him, uh, "How often do you write?" And he says, "Well, I write whenever the spirit moves me, and the spirit moves me every day." <laughs> so he had a process. He sat down, and the spirit moved him. And in the same way, when you sit down and you you follow, you know, various steps. For producing a scene or for producing a, a story, um, nothing is going to happen if the spirit doesn't move you. But uh, once the spirit starts moving you, uh, the, the spirit needs a little help. You know, it needs a little direction. <laughs> and and that's that's what my methods do. I, I just provide people with simple, you know, series of steps for understanding what it is that the spirit is moving them to do. Mm. And I, I actually recently read your How to Write a Novel Using the Snowflake Method, which is, is fan, absolutely fantastic. And it combines, what's nice actually, it combines the outlining with the pantsing approach. In this, in this very nice parable story, um, it teaches whilst you still remember a story, so it's very clever. I wonder if you could um, explain the Snowflake Method in, um, you know, in, in not a whole book. <laughs> And, right. you know, and so people can imagine what that is. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it, I know it took a whole book, but you know, right, yeah. just a snappy uh, one. I can, ex I can explain the snowflake method very simply. The, the basic idea is that you start with a simple, you know, one sentence summary of your story. Mm. Uh, and then you, you build out on that. You expand that to a paragraph. You add characters. You, you uh, expand your paragraph to a page. You, you work more on your characters. And so you're starting from something very simple and small, and you're growing it out bit by bit to something beautiful and very, very complicated. And uh, the reason it's called the snowflake is that there's this famous um, uh, mathematical, you know, it's a geometrical object called the snowflake fractal. And you start out by first just drawing a triangle, and then you just keep it keep uh, you know, making the edges a little bit more complicated and, and you just do that uh, repeatedly over and over and at each iteration it looks more and more like a snowflake and then it, uh, mathematically you're supposed to take that process out to infinity but it doesn't help to do that you know, once the edges get you know, smaller than the width of your pen you're not really helping so you have to stop at a certain point and in the same way you know, we would all like to write you know, work on our novels forever, but our editor makes us uh, turn them in at a certain point. We have a deadline, and that's when we're done. Okay, and so you start with a, just a simple concept, and you 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 build that out um, mm -hmm. until you have a full blown novel. And you know, as you mentioned, the book "How to Write a, a Novel Using the Snowflake Method" is is done as a story because I wanted to show people mm -hmm. how to write rather than telling them how to write. Uh, and so I wanted to use a story of a young woman who's trying to write a novel and is learning to use the snowflake method. Well, I thought this will only be 25,000 words. <clears throat> I'm a big boy now. I, don't, I won't need to use the snowflake method to, to uh, write my story here. And I, I sort of painted myself into a corner. <laughs> and at a certain point, I, I says, okay, backtrack. Backtrack. So I walked over the paint, you know, and I went back to the beginning and I snowflaked out my story and I got it to work. And then I was able to write it completely uh, and, and you know, a, a finish the story. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that I thought I could, uh, I, that I could not have to eat my own dog food here on a, on a simple short uh, story, but I had to. I, I, and, and I enjoyed it much more when, when I got it working correctly, when I was actually using, using my methods. Mm. So the moral for me is that there's a certain method that works best for me. And when I try to deviate from that method, I run into trouble. And everyone is that way. There are seat of the pantsers who absolutely work best by just starting with a blank page and typing. So Stephen King is a great example. Stephen King just starts typing, uh, doesn't know where he's going, but he gets there, okay? And he's brilliant. If he tried to use the snowflake method or outlining or something, he would probably fail miserably or hate it or, you know, quit writing or something. Uh, so Stephen King is, is a, a classic example of a seat of the pantser who should write using seat of the pants. He should not use the snowflake method. Okay, Robert Ludlum was a guy who, who created these 100-page outlines. And I know lots of other writers like him who must have an outline. If they try to write without it, they're going to fail. So we all have our own unique uh, procedure that's going to work best for us. The snowflake just happens to be mine, and it also happens to work very well for a lot of other writers. But I don't ever get religious about it and tell people, well, you, you have to snowflake or you have to do this. Mm. That's just a mistake. When, when, when people are trying to use a process that doesn't work effectively for them, they just run into trouble. And I remember, you know, 10 years ago, one of my friends, yeah, she heard me lecture, give an early lecture on the snowflake method when it was a brand new thing. And she thought, wow, that sounds brilliant. I'm going to try that. Well, she got herself into trouble, and she missed her deadline, and she was tied up in knots, and she couldn't write the story, so she had to go back to, to writing at Seat of the Pants, and she missed her deadline by about four months, so I felt horrible about it, but um, what that taught me, I mean, it was her choice to, to, to try this new method, and it failed, uh, but what that taught me is that different people are different. Mm. 
you know, don't try to be Stephen King if you're Robert Ludlum, and vice versa. Yeah, and I found, I found a few things in it that, you know, put, there are 10 steps, right? And I probably, at five of those steps, I was like, yeah, that's what I do. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm you know, a bit a bit out of all of them. And, and that's what's useful about the book, too. And like you say, people don't have to follow all the 10 steps, right. but there are definitely parts that will be useful. Now, I wanted to ask you about the first step, the one line, because that is actually, of course, that the one line or in film, a log line or the first line of your back blurb or that catchy line, that's actually really, really hard. <laughs> yes. And yet, I mean, and you start with that. I don't, at the moment anyway, I don't start with that. But where I am is trying to get to that early on because exactly what you're saying, once you've got that line, that takes care of a lot of the marketing side as well. So thinking right. about it in advance is good. But can you give any tips for how authors can get that line? Well, you know, I, I remember reading a story, uh, I think it was in first grade, about um, you know a king who offered um, his, his daughter, the princess, in marriage to any man in the kingdom who could <clears throat> leap onto the top of the palace. And you know, all the men in the kingdom came and tried it, and none of them could do it. And the king, you know, he was a, a big, strong guy. He he says, "Look, it's easy." And he leaped onto the top of the palace in, in one jump. And everyone says, "Well, that's amazing." Um, uh, and then this little boy came along, and he stacked up a bunch of boxes to make steps. And he leaped onto the first box, and then he leaped onto the second one. And he leaped onto the third one, and he leaped all the way up to the top of the palace. So. Uh, the moral of that story is, you know, sometimes small steps will will get you where you want to go. I don't know if the king married off his daughter to his little boy or not. It seems a little <laughs> weird, but hey, it was first grade. Okay, uh, the little boy is going to be the hero of a first grader story. Um, but here's what I recommend: you give yourself an hour. It, you, you, if you're trying to snowflake your story, give yourself an hour and just write down a sentence. Try to keep it to under 25 words and focus on one or two characters, the lead characters, and you know what the story's about. And at the end of the hour, you're done. Stop. Move on to the next step, even if it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and the, as you work through the steps of the snowflake, you can always come back and revise your one-sentence summary and make it better. And you should do that because as you understand your characters, as you understand the intricacies of your story and the deep theme of the story, that sort of thing, you're going to understand that one-sentence summary better. And you, sh you should come back. If you come up with a better idea, come back and fix it. And it'll only take 10 seconds right? <laughs> you have an insight and you go, oh, that's what my story really is. Well, you know, don't, don't agonize for days and weeks and months over one, you know, uh, crummy little log line. Do what you can and move on. Mm. Um, yeah. And that, that has worked for me. And I actually have some of my stories that I still have never come up with a really great uh, one sentence summary of. But I had enough to move me on to the next step. And that's, that's the point of it. It's the goal of each step in the snowflake is to give you enough so that you can move to the, the next step. And the tenth step of the snowflake is to write your first draft. So the purpose of the snowflake method is to help you get through to write your first, the first draft of your novel. If you do that and it's a good first draft, then the snowflake succeeded for you. If you can't reach your first draft that way, then the snowflake doesn't work for you and don't use it. Mm. And one of the other things you have is a, a scene list, which I definitely do kind of, I do partly a scene list. I do like a, about 10 scenes and then I start writing and then I come back and do some more. But, but the actual concept of a scene was something that I, until the penny dropped for me, I, did, I don't think I could have written anything. So for anyone who the penny hasn't dropped yet, what is a scene and why is it so important and why is it different to a chapter? Okay, a scene is the fundamental unit of fiction. So in a scene, you need to have some conflict. And there's actually two different types of scenes that the novel, novelists typically use. One of those is called the reactive scene and one of those is the proactive scene. The proactive scene is more common uh, it starts with a goal. So the, char the lead character for that scene has some sort of a, a, 
a short-term goal that they want to accomplish at a particular location at a particular time. Okay, so that's a very key thing. A scene happens at a particular place at a particular time. Maybe it's you know in a seat on an airplane. Maybe it's in a boxing ring. At, you know, maybe it's you know on a street in Washington D.C. But it's a one place, one time, and the lead character has some sort of a goal that they want to achieve. There's conflict. They, they don't get it right away, and then by the end of the scene, they have some sort of a setback. They don't typically achieve their goal. Uh, once in a while, you know, you have to give somebody their goal. If they're, they're desperately trying to uh, not drown, <laughs> you, you don't want to drown your, your, your lead character, usually, unless you're writing a reincarnation story. <laughs> So um, that's the basic pattern of a, uh, a proactive scene. You have a goal, a conflict, and, and a setback at the end. Uh, now, a reactive scene is, is different. Uh, as a result of that setback, uh, your reader may, uh, your, your, your character may be feeling bad, and they need to, to uh, uh, you know, react to that in some way. So there will be some sort of an emotional reaction to the previous uh, uh, setback, and then then they'll kind of get a grip on themselves and work through, um, uh, you know, the various uh, horns of the dilemma that they're on, trying to figure out what do I do next. And at the end of the scene, uh, they make a decision, and that decision then forms the goal for the next proactive scene. So you have uh, proactive scenes that that lead naturally to reactive scenes, which lead naturally to proactive scenes. Mm. Uh, Anyway, that's that's what I uh, I have a whole article on on how that works called uh, writing the perfect scene on, that's on my website. Um, mm. So if, if people are interested in that, that's where, that's where you can go. Mm. And just, Google sorry, uh, Google writing the perfect scene. You'll find me. You'll find it. Um, and the difference between a scene and a chapter, I know people get confused over. Okay, a chapter is a purely arbitrary division of pages. Uh, I shoot for chapters that are about 10 pages long because for me that's about the right length for a chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, some authors, I know uh, James Patterson mm -hmm. likes uh, like you know, two, two, two or three page uh, chapters. Uh, you know, Michael Crichton was moving in that direction before he died. He was getting to you know much shorter chapters. Uh, you know, a, a chapter is the fundamental unit of, uh, of reader decision. So if it's 3 a.m. and your reader has just finished a chapter, uh, they're going to they're gonna be thinking in their head, okay, the next chapter is only going to be three pages. I, have, I can read for another five minutes and read that, or it's only ten pages. I can read um, another 20 minutes and, and, and get through that. Um, mm. uh, so, but a chapter is completely arbitrary. You could have all your chapters be, be very short. My average scene is about four pages. My average chapter is about 10 pages. So I have, you know, on average, two and a half scenes per chapter. But that really means some, some chapters are two scenes, some chapters are three scenes, and some are five, because I, I'll sometimes have very, very short scenes. Um, and sometimes have very long scenes, maybe mm. 10 pages or 12 pages. Mm. Well, it's funny. It, yeah, I like the way you're describing it as a sort of organization and a reader, you know, the moment the reader makes a, a decision. Um, and I, I had James Scott Bell on, and one of the things he said was cutting off your scene earlier than you would have, you know, cut off the last few paragraphs. So you essentially, you know, leave the reader hanging on, um, right. which, is, which is a good tip. But anyway, I want to come back on your website because you have this amazing e-zine, which is just chock full of amazing stuff. And I was looking back through some of your back articles, of which there are, there must be thousands now. <laughs> Hundreds, yeah. <laughs> it's 10 years of... Uh, 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 of content. Easy. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so one of your articles, which I thought was brilliant, said, most fiction writers have a major bottleneck in their process. That bottleneck is that they don't produce enough first draft copy. And I just went, oh, that is me. I've got a list on my wall of like 12 books that I want to write. And I, if I had the first draft copy, it would all be fine. So what can writers do about that bottleneck? <laughs> yeah, it's funny you mentioned Jim Jim Bell, James Scott Bell. He's a good friend of mine, um, and he's always talking about the importance of production plans, which we talked about you and I in my last easing. 
Uh, but one of the things Jim told me years ago, he called it the Nifty 350, which was just, you know, commit to yourself every day you're going to write 350 uh, words uh, and, and then you, you may write more. Well, I was thinking about that a, a few um, months ago and, uh, you know, again, reflecting on the fact that I'm not producing as much. And, of course, I wanted to outdo Jim. You know, Jim only does 350. So I came up with the idea of the 500 Club, which works like this. You just commit to yourself every day. I'm going to write 500 words. Um, that's all. That's all. That, you know, and most of us can write 500 words in, say, half an hour to an hour. I write about um, 1,100 words per hour. So that's a little bit under half an hour. Mm. <clears throat> it's not a big time commitment. And so... It's easy to say every day I will write 500 words for the rest of my life. Okay. Now, what's hard is, of course, to actually do that every day, but the goal here is to make it as easy as possible. And so, in my, in my mind, uh, you know, thinking 500 words, I can, I can really buzz that out, no problem. I'll just sit down and, and drill out a few words. But... What happens is, and this is why this is brilliant, uh, you know, I, I got the idea from Jim. I think it is really a brilliant idea. Once you have drilled out that 500 words, you know, for me, I'm midway into a scene. I'm not going to stop at 500. I'm going to go on to write 1,000. And then maybe I'll write another scene because I'm hot and I really am, am, am on it. And I'll write 2,000 words or maybe I have 2,500 or 3,000 words. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the entry barrier is low. It's only 500 words, right? Uh, and we all, you know, try to, we avoid getting started writing because we have this inertia, you know, we don't like to get, get started, mm -hmm. but we also have that inertia. Once we're started, we don't like to stop. So what's brilliant about the idea is that uh, there's a low barrier to enter. You get rolling and then you just don't want to stop. And it has happened that I, you know, sit down and three hours later I come out of this brain fog that I'm in and I realize, wow, you know, I did 3,500 words today. That's seven whole days worth. But it doesn't mean I'm off the hook for the next seven days because tomorrow mm -hmm. I still have to do my 500 words. Mm -hmm. And so what I have found is that when I'm on this program, uh, you know, which this only works really for, for writing first draft copy, but when I'm on this program, you know, my typical output is going to be somewhere around 1,500 to 2,500 words every day. And even if you only did 500 words every day, that would still be two full-length novels per year. You know, that would be 180,000 words per year. That's two 90,000-word novels. Uh, and I wish I could write that short, but I don't actually. <laughs> I tend to write longer books. Um, but the point is that... Um, Production translates into books, and Stephen King writes about 2,000 words every day. You know, in his book on writing, he talks about how, um, you know, when reporters ask him, you know, what, you know, how, how much do you write? He, he, he tells them that he writes 2,000 days you know, every day except July 4th and Christmas and his birthday, and they all laugh and think that's hilarious, uh, and it is because he lied there. Yeah. He writes on his birthday, and he writes on Christmas, yeah. and he writes on Fourth of July because he can't help it, and that's why Stephen King is it's Stephen, Stephen King. King. <laughs> I, yeah, okay, Stephen King has some magic to him, mm. but that's the secret to his enormous productivity is that he's he's got a you know daily word count of a couple of thousand words that he he puts out. That's he's just sort of scratching that itch to write, and you know most of us don't have quite that strong of an itch to write, but five hundred words is doable. And so, you know, I think it was in Jan uh, April, uh, March or April, I wrote my article in my easing on the 500 Club, and I just challenged people uh, to uh, join the 500 Club. You know, there isn't any place you could go to sign up, uh, but just mentally um, uh, commit to yourself, I'm going to write 500 words today, and I'm going to write 500 words tomorrow, and I'm going to keep on doing that for the rest of my life. Mm. Uh, it's a tremendously valuable thing. No, um, it's fan fantastic. 
Uh, and then before we before we wrap up, I just had one other question because I saw on your about page um, that you're a professional speaker and you speak at a lot of conferences now and you, you go around everywhere. And you mentioned that you had a panic disorder around speaking and a lot of authors are chronic introverts. They don't want to do this stuff, but I think you have to eventually. So how do you how did you deal with that panic? Is it something that you manage or that you got over? Uh, it's not something you get over. Panic disorder is not something that you can just fix, okay, by yourself. You, you really need to get counseling. And, um, you know, we had been talking to a counselor about some issues with, uh, you know, one of my daughters. And uh, he, he spent like half an hour talking to my wife and me. And he says, I don't think the problem is with her. I think the problem is with dad. I think dad has some problems. And I'm thinking, yeah, that may wait a second, I'm dad. What are you talking about? I don't have any problems. There's nothing wrong with me. Uh, but then later on that summer, I went to um, give a talk um, at a conference that was all female. So it was you know, a couple of hundred romance writers. And I was going to talk about how guys think, writing from the male point of view. And the more I thought about it, the more scared I got about doing that because I, I realized if I'm going to talk about that, I have to tell the truth. I'm not going to just sort of glaze things over. And what that means is I have to be honest. And being honest can be really, really embarrassing. And so I did give the talk. It's, I think, the most famous talk in the whole history of that organization's conferences there were 200 people there, and I, I swear 700 different people have told me they were at that talk. But I had a, I had a panic attack for the entire conference. Just run, it did, didn't stop, and it didn't stop until the speaker introduced me, and I got up and put the microphone in front of my face, and then it went away. And I gave the talk. So you know, my particular panic disorder, it showed up before the talk. But it was absolutely miserable. And I went home from the conference and I go, okay, that was fun. I really enjoyed the talk. I didn't enjoy the part beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the counselor and I says, you remember you said there was something wrong with dad? Why don't we fix dad here? And so we did. Uh, and, you know, panic disorder can have many different causes. It can be a chemical imbalance in your brain. If that's the case, then the solution is meds. Okay, there are various meds for panic disorder, and I know writers who are going to be on Paxil or on Wellbutrin for the rest of their life. In my case, I was lucky. You know, one, one of the possible causes of panic disorder is trauma in your early childhood. Okay, well, luckily I had some of that. And uh, we did some counseling on that, and it solved the problem. And just a few months after um, that very traumatic conference that I had, I went to another conference, gave the exact same talk, and my editor was in the audience. And she came up to me afterwards, she gave me a big head, a big hug, and she says, whatever it is you've been doing, keep doing that, because it's really working. There's amazing change here that's, that's happened in you. And she was right. I didn't have panic disorder anymore. It was fixed. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know, I can't really take any credit other than I cooperated with uh, this counselor. Um, but, you know, whatever it takes to solve your problem, uh, do, do what it takes. Um, you know, we all have handicaps. You know, we have things in our lives that keep us from being who we want to be. If we're, if we're trying to write novelists, some of us have, you know, issues. Find a way to deal with that. You know, face the fact that you have a problem and go go tackle it. Don't don't live your life carrying a heavy load if you can get help from someone. Mm. You know, that's the lesson that I took away from that. And uh, for for years after that, I used to, you know, when I gave talks at conferences, uh, at the end of you know my series of talks, I would always end uh, by saying. Um, you know, most of you don't know this, but I used to have panic disorder. And the thing that triggered my, my uh, panic attacks most was speaking in public. And they would all laugh because I had just finished, you know, two or three or ten hours of speaking, and I appeared to be completely relaxed and at home and at ease. And I was. And I says, listen, you all have problems. 
uh, you know, some of you may have panic disorder, you may have OCD, you may have uh, you know, various psychological problems. If you do, get some counseling, get help. Don't be too proud um, to accept help just because you know, it's some sort of a, uh, there, there's a problem in your head. Mm. You know, if, if you had a broken bone, you would go to a doctor and get it set. If, you're, if your thinking is broken or twisted, Go to a counselor and get it fixed if you possibly can. Mm. Well, thanks so much for your honesty with that, Randy. That's that's really great. And I mean, I I totally admit to anxiety. You know, I, I, anxiety, chronic anxiety, anxiety yeah. but not quite panic disorder. But um, I actually did CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, once for a, a phobia that never went away. It's just something I manage. And but it's so it's interesting. I think this honesty is so important for people to realise that you know that, that we often think people are sort of superhuman when they're speakers or when they're right. successful or whatever and and it's not true we're i mean a lot of us are writers because we are so flawed i guess and you know <laughs> exactly yeah I, I would say uh your 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 flaws you know your human things that, that the, the things that hold you down are the things that are ultimately going to make you your best as a writer mm, yeah. uh, it's the overcoming that is um is what's more important than the, uh, yeah, than just the Superman who, who never have problems. And even Superman had kryptonite, right? <laughs> <laughs> he okay. did, he did indeed. It, life is a struggle. <laughs> I mean, if we learn anything from Charles Darwin, it's that life is a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> fight, is... fight, fight. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so we've run out of time. So tell people where they can find you and your books online. All right, I'm very easy to find. Just Google how to write a novel. Click on the first result. That'll take you right to my Snowflake page on how to write a novel. It's at advancedfictionwriting.com. And, uh, you know, I have a big footprint online. It's very hard to miss me. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Randy. That was great. Thanks for having me, Joanna.